suffering at the hands of Rome, cause they believed in Christ alone. They died through Europe, especially Spain, for they saw all but Christ is vain. He suffered by his death for men to save them from their awful sin. Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand. The Roman popes rule the land. Those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy. We won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie, with 50 million reasons why. Salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. A sovereign God give faith to man, salvation's in the Maker's hand. This gospel offends Rome today. They offer up another way, a counterfeit, a compromise. Beware the ancient papal lie with such a cloud of witnesses who by grace died in their Lord. Recall their memory to say, by the same faith we live today. Good evening. Welcome to Walt's Mystery Babylon News Radio. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next two hours. We're reading and discussing the book Romanism and the Reformation, a lecture by Henry Grattan Guinness, this particular lecture entitled Interpretation of the Reformers. Now, if you've been listening very carefully over the course of this book, you realize that the Reformers simply believed what all Bible-believing Christians before them believed, that the papacy was the, was the Antichrist. That belief went all the way back to apostolic times. The, ap- the apostolic Christians, those who sat under the tutelage of Paul the Apostle, were looking for the rise of Antichrist, and they knew that it would rise after the fall of the pagan Roman Empire after the fall of the Caesars. And then another Roman power would take its place, and that would be the Antichrist of the Bible, who would deceive the whole world and who would persecute the saints. That is the papacy, and they dare to call it the Holy Roman Empire. With any, without any further ado, I'm going to continue uh, by, we ended on page 253 in the book uh, last Sunday, but I'm going to retreat for continuity purposes to the very last paragraph on page 251. This is the most powerful portion of this book. If there are any distractions, please put them aside and listen carefully to what Henry Bratton Guinness says beginning in the last paragraph on page 251. To resist the use to which Scripture prophecy was put by the Reformers is no light or unimportant matter. The system of prophetic interpretation known as futurism does resist this use. It condemns the interpretation of the Reformers. It condemns the views of all these men and of all the martyrs and of all the confessors and faithful witnesses of Christ for long centuries. It condemns the Albigenses, the Waldenses, the Wycliffeites, the Hussites and the Lollards, the Lutherans, the Calvinists. It condemns them all and upon a point upon which they are all agreed, an interpretation of Scripture which they embodied in their solemn confessions and sealed with their blood. It condemns the spring of their action, 
the foundation of the structure they created. How daring is this act? And how destitute of justification. What an opposition to the pillars of the work most manifestly divine. For it is no less than this. For futurism asserts that Luther and all the reformers were wrong in this fundamental point. And whose interpretation of prophecy does it justify and approve? That of the Romanists. Let this be clearly seen. Rome felt the force of these prophecies and sought to evade it. It had no way but to deny their applicability. It could not deny their existence in Scripture. They were there plainly enough, but it denied that these prophecies referred to the Romish church and its head. It pushed them aside. It shifted them from the entire field of medieval and modern history. As to Babylon the Great, it asserted that it meant Rome pagan, not Rome papal. Rome pagan shed all the blood referred to in Revelations chapter 17 and 18. Rome Christian had shed none of it. Prophecy was eloquent about the deeds of the Caesars, but silent as to those of the popes. And this, though the persecutions perpetrated by the popes, had exceeded those of the Caesars. Prophecy expended its strength in warning the church of the perils from heathenism, which it perfectly understood and was speechless as to the far greater perils arising from the Christian apostasy on which it needed the fullest warning and instruction. It was eagle-eyed as to the dangers from without, but blind to the dangers from within. It guided and guarded the church of the three first centuries, but left the church of the next thousand years and more without a lamp to light its footsteps. As to the prophecies of the man of sin or Antichrist, these had nothing to do with the Middle Ages or the Roman popes or the long central centuries of the church's sorest conflicts. They only referred to a diminutive interval in the far-off future at the end of the world. The man of sin was only an ephemeral an ephemeral persecutor. His whole power was to continue but three and one-half years. He was to be a cunning Jew of the tribe of Dan, a clever infidel who was to call himself God and set himself up in a Jewish temple at Jerusalem. Christians had nothing to do with him as such. A Jew was to do all the mischief, The whole evil was but a Jewish infidel spasm at the very last hour of history before the second advent. Therefore, the reformers were all wrong in their denunciation of the papacy. They were foolish, misguided, unreasonable, fanatical, and the popes were uncondemned by the voices of the prophets. Daniel and John said nothing about them, They were not the predicted apostates. What though they did shed the blood of heretics like water and drink it like wine and make themselves drunken with it and exalt themselves above kings and above the world and clothe themselves with wealth and splendor, with purple and scarlet, gold and pearls. What though they did sit supreme upon the seven hills and ride and rule the Roman Empire in its divided Gothic state, and use its power for the persecution of heretics and the suppression of what some presume to call the gospel of Jesus Christ. The prophecies which those contemptible reformers and miserable so-called martyrs said applied to them did nothing of the sort. It was folly to suppose they did. They applied to other people and to other circumstances. 
they only applied to paganism and infidelity, a past and bygone paganism and a future short-lived infidelity and nothing more. Three centuries in the past and three years in the future, that was all they had anything to do with. As to the 15 centuries which lay between, they had no bearing upon them whatever. Popes might make themselves easy, and cardinals and councils and papal princes and priests, inquisitors and persecutors, Dominicans and Jesuits. Now, for those who don't know who the Dominicans or the Jesuits are, the Dominicans were an order of monks that were set aside and specially empowered to gather up and persecute and to annihilate God's chosen people, those who believe in Jesus Christ and reject the papacy. And when the Dominicans had fallen into corruption, <clears throat> as though persecuting the saints is not enough corruption, they were replaced by the Jesuits. The Jesuits became the persecutors of Protestants and all Bible believers everywhere, and they remain so today. The heads of the bloody Jesuit Council of Trent and the leaders of the Counter-Reformation, the Jesuits, Learn not only how to spell their name, but learn their entire history. Then you will know who and how they deceived us. But Henry Grattan Guinness knows that they are the author of futurism. That, that, that view of Bible prophecy that is held today that is completely contrary to the beliefs held by all Christians before them all the way back to apostolic times. They believe the Jesuit futurism. They believe that Antichrist won't come until the last three and a half years before Christ's return. And they are wrong. I'll continue. He says, the thunders of prophecy were not directed against them but against those dead Caesars and that unborn Jew. And so they puffed at the reformers and scoffed at the martyrs and scorned and derided and despised them and went on in their proud tyranny and abated nothing of their blasphemous pretensions and bloody persecutions. Which think you are right in their interpretations of the Scripture? Those proud popes those cruel inquisitors, those inhuman monsters who mangled the bodies of holy men and women in their torture chambers, those sanctimonious murderers who stirred up all the might of Christendom from century to century against the gospel and against the faithful witnesses of Jesus, or those pure and persecuted saints, those faithful Waldenses and Wycliffites, those earnest Hussites and Lollards, those self-sacrificing Lutherans and Huguenots, those noble confessors, reformers, and martyrs. With one mind and mouth, all these Protestants agreed in the substance of their protest. To them, Rome was Babylon, and its proud head, the Antichrist. Were they all mistaken? deluded, and their cruel, tyrannical oppressors and persecutors correct? What think you? Perhaps you say, but was Rome right in nothing? Must the doctrine be wrong because Rome holds it? Does not Rome hold the truth as to the divinity of Christ and as to some other points of importance? I grant, Rome holds some truths, it would have no moral power unless it did. Even the Mohammedans hold some great truths, and the heathen also. But mark this down. This is a question of Rome's judgment concerning herself and the bearing of prophecy on her own history and character. 
It is here in this judgment that the futurist claims that Rome was right and the reformers in the wrong. And the consequences are most serious. Let me repeat what Henry Grattan Guinness said. And the consequences are most serious. For we are living in an age of revived papal activity. Not only is the papacy exerting an enormous influence in the outside world, not only has it formulated and decreed its own infallibility, not only is it attacking Protestantism in its strongholds with every weapon in its reach, political, civil, religious, but the principles and practices of the system it guides and governs have been introduced into the bosom of the Protestant church and planted securely within its walls and are working most disastrously for its corruption and overthrow. I'm here to tell you, futurism has overthrown Grown Protestantism. There's no more Protestant voice in Washington, D.C. There's no more Protestant voice in the churches today. They are all Roman because they preach futurism, which exonerates the entire bloody Antichrist history of the papacy. And it puts us all in grave jeopardy of joining under the altar of God the saints who have been slain before us. Futurism has placed me and all true Protestants, what few there are left in this country and around the world, in the same jeopardy as was the Waldenses, the Huguenots, the Hussites, the Wycliffites, the Lollards, all of the true Bible believers before our time simply because they no longer believe that the Pope is the Antichrist. And not only that, but they want to rejoin him in this global ecumenical movement that unites all the world's religions under the authority of the papacy and calls for a one-world government. Henry Grattan Guinness continues, he says, Never was there a time in the church's history when she more needed the barriers which prophecy has erected for her protection. And now when they are so sorely needed, they are not to be found. Futurism has crept into the Protestant church and broken down these sacred walls. Romanists, Ritualists and Protestant futurists are all agreed as to the non-applicability of Scripture prophecies to the Church of Rome and the papacy. The Romanists are 200 millions. The ritualists are hundreds of thousands. And Protestant futurists are many thousands in number. They all deny these prophecies their place and office. They remove these barriers. What then is to keep out this incoming papal flood? The word of prophecy and its solemn warnings and dangers uh, of the dangers the church has to encounter, the foes it has to resist, is asserted to be silent as to this. Why then should this be feared? The reformers were mistaken. The popes were right. Charles V and Charles IX, Philip of Spain and Mary of England, the Duke of Alba and Louis the Fourteenth, and all the tribe of Innocents and Leos and Gregories and Clements and Pius the Fourth and Pope Pius the Ninth, all these were right in their rejecting the fundamental position that papal Rome is Babylon and its head Antichrist. And all the reformers, without exception, were wrong in maintaining it. They were foolish interpreters of the sure word of prophecy and utterly in error as to the real testimony of Scripture concerning the Church of Rome. 
Is this the position you adopt? Is this the conclusion you defend? Are these the views you advocate? You, a Protestant? And this, after all that has been written upon the subject, and all the blaze of light which history and experience have poured upon it, if it is, look to it that you be not found fighting against the truth, warring against the word of God, resisting the testimony of the prophetic spirit, hindering the work of the Reformation, promoting the progress of the apostasy, opposing Christ, and helping Antichrist. Even the Romanists themselves shame you in their clear-sighted comprehension of the issues of this question. Cardinal Manning says, quote, the Catholic Church is either the masterpiece of Satan or the kingdom of the Son of God, unquote. Cardinal Newman says, quote, a sacerdotal order that is a priestly order is historically the essence of the Church of Rome. If not divinely appointed, it is doctrinally the essence of Antichrist, unquote. In both these statements, the issue is clear, and it is the same. Rome herself admits, openly admits, that if she is not the very kingdom of Christ, she is that of Antichrist. Rome declares she is one or the other. She herself propounds and urges this solemn alternative. You shrink from it, do you? I accept it. Conscience constrains me. History compels me. The past, the awful past, rises before me. I see the great apostasy. I see the desolation of Christendom. I see the smoking ruins. I see the reign of monsters. I see those vice gods, that Gregory the Seventh, that Innocent the Third, that Boniface the Eighth, that Alexander the Sixth, that Gregory the Thirteenth, that Pius the Ninth. I see their long succession. I hear their insufferable blasphemies. I see their abominable lives. I see them worshipped by blinded generations, bestowing hollow benedictions, bartering lying indulgences, creating a paganized Christianity. I see their liveried slaves, their shaven priests, their celibate confessors. I see the infamous confessional, the ruined women, the murdered innocents. I hear the lying absolutions, the dying groans. I hear the cries of the victims. I hear the anathemas, the curses, the thunders of the interdicts. I see the racks, the dungeons, the stakes. I see that inhuman inquisition, those fires of Smithfield, those butcheries of St. Bartholomew, that Spanish armada, those, in, those unspeakable dragon aids, that endless train of wars, that dreadful multitude of massacres, I see it all. And in the name of the ruin it has wrought in the church and in the world, in the name of the truth it has denied, the temple it has defiled, the God it has blasphemed, the souls it has destroyed, in the name of the millions it has deluded, the millions it has slaughtered, the millions it has damned, with holy confessors, with noble reformers, with innumerable martyrs, with the saints of ages, I denounce it as the masterpiece of Satan, as the body and soul and essence of Antichrist. And so ends Lecture 6 of Henry Grattan Guinness's book, Romanism and the Reformation, 
and the interpretation of Bible prophecies by Protestant reformers. You have to stop and think to yourself. How many of those left in this world who call themselves Christians have even a clue about all that Henry Grattan Guinness just said? And don't you feel some commitment in your life, some calling in your life to help wake up your brothers and sisters who are deluded with futurism? Tell bent to Rome. We have to wake them up. The issues are too clear. The threat too real. The consequences too horrifying to remain silent. Futurism is a lie, a strong delusion. Rome has only begun to claim the souls of the saints. Rome is headed for her last hurrah, and it's going to be the bloodiest of all history, simply because Protestants have forgotten their Protestantism. The most important message today, aside from the fact that Jesus is the Savior of the world, the Redeemer of mankind, who bore our sins on his body and redeemed us from a Christless eternity, aside from that, the most important message today is who is the Antichrist of prophecy? The most important message today is that the papacy is the Antichrist of prophecy and history. And there's not even another runner-up for the job. And until Protestants relearn what at one time had sunk to the marrow of their bones, that the Pope is the Antichrist, the papacy is the Antichrist of Scripture, and the Roman Catholic Church, the very synagogue of Satan, then this ecumenical movement, which was only made possible by futurism, will add multitudes, countless multitudes to the list of martyrs claimed by Rome. It's a big job, and one man can't do it. It has to take spirit-led Christians all over this world to scream the warning from the rooftops by every means and every mode of communication there is and never cease, no matter what the threat comes from Rome. And if we fail from that moral obligation, then I fear the consequences. I'm going to preach this message till God takes my last breath. You do as the Lord leads. Lecture 7. Interpretation and use of these prophecies in post-Reformation times. Three centuries have rolled by since the accomplishment of the Glorious Reformation. These centuries have a double aspect, a Protestant and a papal. On the one hand, they present the spectacle of an era of liberty and light. And on the other hand, 
of reaction and revolution. In the history of Protestantism, these centuries have been an era of liberty, civil and religious. In A.D. 1500, there was not a free nation in Europe. All were subject to the tyrannical government of Rome. Now, half Europe and America are free from that intolerable yoke. In the year 1500, there was hardly a Protestant to be found in the world. Rome had exterminated them all by prolonged and cruel persecution. At the present day, Protestants are 150 million in number. And the last three centuries have been an era of light. At their commencement, the human mind experienced an emancipation and was furnished with new instruments. Learning was revived and the art of printing discovered. Since then, the Word of God has been multiplied, translated, and expounded as never before. And the understanding of prophecy has shared the general advance. During this time, libraries have been written on the prophetic scriptures. Mighty interpreters have been raised up, men such as Mead, Sir Isaac Newton, Eliot, whose investigations have drawn back the veil of long-continued ignorance and let in new light upon some of the darkest obscurities of the time. Interpreters have risen in groups like constellation of stars, and knowledge has increased. On the other hand, post-Reformation times have been times of papal reaction and revolution. In the first place, the Protestant Reformation was encountered by a tremendous papal reaction. The rising wave of life and liberty was met by a counter wave of resistance. Hardly was the ship of a Protestant church set free and launched upon the deep than there arose a mighty tempest. The resurrection of the slain witnesses of Christ in the person of the reformers was answered by a resurrection of all the powers of the pit. The awakening of men's souls brought war, ecclesiastical and civil, a war of anathemas and a war of extermination. Swords flashed forth. Flames were kindled. Rome rose in its anger and its might and did wondrously. She thundered excommunications. She slaughtered millions not without an awful struggle would the prince of darkness give up his kingdom. No, look to it, ye brave reformers. Ye will need the armory of heaven and its help, for the host of hell are roused against you. You may conquer, but it shall be through strife and anguish and seas of blood. Draw up your confessions of faith, ye blessed restorers of pure gospel. Dare to give them to the world, if you will, but ye shall be stoutly answered. Against your confession of Augsburg, Rome shall erect her Council of Trent. She shall formulate her canons and decrees. She shall impose her creed of Pope Pius IV and utter her chorus of anathemas. Rise up, O Luther! Cry out concerning the Babylonian captivity of the church. Burn the papal bull. Rouse Germany. But you shall have your match. Satan shall bring forth his Loyola, and Loyola his Jesuits. Subtle, learned, saintly in garb and name, protean in form, infinite in disguises, innumerable scholars, teachers, theologians, confessors of princes, politicians, rhetoricians, casuists, instruments keen, unscrupulous, double-edged, men fitted to every sphere and every enterprise. They shall swarm against the Church of the Reformation each one wise in the wisdom and strong in the strength 
which are not from above, but from beneath. Rise up, Zwingli, thou lion of Zurich. Lead forth thy brave Swiss against the enemies of liberty and truth. But you must perish on the battlefield ere your cause succeed. Ride forth, fair flower of France. Strive, ye brave Huguenots, for your country's freedom and the faith of the gospel. But Paris shall run with your blood. You shall fall like leaves from a tree shaken by tempest. You shall lie in heaps like rubbish in the streets. Your bodies shall choke the streams. They shall rot in rivers. They shall hang in chains. They shall be shoveled into cemeteries or buried in dung heaps. Rome shall ring her joy bells and sing her te deums and fill her cathedrals and palaces with acclamations because the massacre of St. Bartholomew has overthrown for a time the work of the Reformation in France. Stand up, ye Hollanders. Stand up, William the Silent. Stand up, ye men of Harlem and Rotterdam, of Amsterdam and Leiden, ye brave burghers and earnest theologians. Ye dare to contend for civil liberty and sacred truth. Your land shall groan beneath the tread of Alva's troops. Your fortresses shall fall. Your citizens shall be thrust through with Spanish swords. Your possessions shall be plundered. Your wives and your daughters shall be dishonored and foully murdered. Your children trampled beneath horses' hooves and trodden down like mire in the streets. Break thy chains, O England. Rome shall find means to rivet them again. Thou shalt have thy bloody Mary and thy fires of Smithfield. Protestant bishops shall burn for it. Against thy sea-girt isle, Spain shall send her proud armada. A fleet of 130 great ships of war shall come across the seas, 12 of them named after the 12 apostles. They shall be laden with seamen and troops and swords and guns, with priests and Jesuits. The Pope shall bless the banners. Woe to thee, O England, if heaven help thee not, if its winds forsake thy cause. Combine yourselves together, you Protestant states of Germany. Claim your rights of conscience. Stand for the truth. Establish your Protestant liberties. But you shall have your desolating war of 30 years. From Bohemia to the broad waters of, Sh of the Scheldt, from the banks of the Po to the shores of the Baltic, whose countries shall be devastated, harvests destroyed, cities and villages reduced to ruins, half Europe shall be set on fire and civilization shall be buried for a season in bloodshed and barbarism. The apostate church commands the swords of Latin Christendom. The harlot rides the beast, and the beast has claws and great iron teeth and sharp, strong horns and inhuman ferocity. She sits proudly upon it, and it obeys her, grasping, rending, and crushing whom she will. But what if the beast should grow weary of carrying her? What if the beast should take a dislike to her usurping ways? What if it should resist her and cast her off and turn its power against her and serve her as she has served others? Ah, that would be a different story but not an experience unforetold. John foresaw it would be thus 18 centuries ago, and history has fulfilled his predictions. 
for Romish reaction was followed by Democratic Revolution. 1572 was followed by 1793. The Massacre of St. Bartholomew by the Reign of Terror. France papal crushed France Protestant and was crushed in its turn by France infidel. Have you not heard of Voltaire, of Rousseau, of Robespierre, of Danton, and the execution of Louis the Sixteenth and Marie Antoinette, of the massacres in Paris in 1793, of the guillotine, of the noyades and the wholesale drownings, of how the River Loire was choked with corpses of the War of Leventi, of the worship of the goddess of reason, of the turning cathedrals into stables, of the 40,000 churches, chapels, and oratories torn down by the revolutionists, of the massacre and the banishment of priests and Jesuits, of the burning of palaces, the beggaring of princes, the overthrow of monarchy and government and aristocracy and corrupt religion, as by the heavings of a social earthquake, or the outburstings of an irresistible volcano. Have you not heard of how the infidel democracy rose in its might, struck down the powers which had deceived and oppressed it, confiscated all the vast revenues of the Roman Catholic Church, the domains of the crown, the estates of the nobles, slaughtered 1,022,000 persons of all ranks and ages, of both sexes, till the streets of Paris ran with blood and the guillotines could not overtake their work? And have you not heard how a little later on the papal states were conquered by Napoleon and converted into a Roman republic? How the papacy was extinguished The Vatican plundered, ecclesiastical property confiscated, and the Pope dragged from the altar and sent as a prisoner to die in exile? Are not these matters of history and of recent history? Here's Thiers' history of the French Revolution. Here's Allison's history of that revolution in 12 volumes. And here's Carlyle's history of the same, written as with a pen of fire. It is but a century since these things were accomplished, and the afterwaves of that mighty revolution are rolling still. These two great movements, which have followed the Reformation, the papal reaction of the 16th and 17th centuries, and the revolution of the 18th century have mightily helped to open men's eyes to the true character of Romanism and to the fulfillment of the prophetic scriptures. The last three centuries have consequently witnessed a great advance in the comprehension of prophecy. And we are this evening to study the expositions which have resulted. First, Note the fact that Rome's reply to the Reformation in the 16th century included an answer to the prophetic teachings of the Reformers. Through the Jesuits, Ribera, and Bellarmine, Rome put forth her futurist interpretation of prophecy. Ribera was a Jesuit priest of Salamanca. In 1585, he published a commentary on the Apocalypse, denying the application of the prophecies concerning Antichrist to the existing Church of Rome. He was followed by Cardinal Bellarmine, a nephew of Pope Marcellus II, who was born in Tuscany in 1542 and died in Rome in 1621. Bellarmine was not only a man of great learning, but the most powerful controversialist in defense of popery that the Roman Church ever produced. 
Clement VIII used these remarkable words on his nomination. Quote, we choose him because the church of God does not possess his equal in learning, unquote. Bellarmine, like Ribera, advocated the futurist interpretation of prophecy. He taught that Antichrist would be one particular man, that he would be a Jew, that he would be preceded by the reappearance of the literal Enoch and Elias, that he would rebuild the Jewish temple at Jerusalem, compel circumcision, abolish the Christian sacraments, abolish every other form of religion, would manifestly and avowedly deny Christ, would assume to be Christ, and would be received by the Jews as their Messiah, would pretend to be God, would make a literal image speak, would feign himself dead and rise again, and would conquer the whole world, Christian, Mohammedan, and heathen. And all this, in the space of three and one-half years. He insisted that the prophecies of Daniel, Paul, and John, with reference to the Antichrist, had no application whatever to the papal power. The futurist writings of Ribera, Bellarmine, were ably answered by Brightman, of whose work on the Apocalypse published about the year 1600. This is a copy. And they have been answered since this time in a succession of learned works which I cannot stop to enumerate, for I desire to dwell upon another, and as I regard it, a more important phase of prophetic interpretation marking the last three centuries, a phase not of a negative, but of a positive character. Protestant interpreters have done more than answer the false futurism of the Roman Church. They have built up the true historic interpretation of prophecy. They have built up a solid and symmetrical system, a system which has developed slowly, which has progressed constantly, which has been born not of diligent investigation only, but of profound experience a system whose truth has been sealed and demonstrated by its ever-growing correspondence with the actual course of events. True theology, like true science, is slow in development. The growth of astronomy, for example, has extended through 6,000 years. The system of Ptolemy was correct by that of, was, excuse me, The system of Ptolemy was corrected by that of Copernicus. That of Copernicus was advanced by the laws of Kepler and the wonderful discoveries of Newton, and then they're further perfected by the Herschels and many others in recent times. Keeping strictly to the prophecies related to Romanism and the Reformation, I'll now endeavor to show you some of the analogous progress which has been made in their, pre, in their comprehension during the last 250 years. The following names represent a complete pillar of the prophetic interpretation. Joseph Mead, Sir Isaac Newton, Giraud, Vitringa, Dabas, Fleming, de Chasso, Bishop Newton, Faber, Cunningham, Keith, Bickerstaff, Wadsworth, Elliot, and Burks. Their principal works are on this table, and I will now briefly trace the progress they exhibited, prophetic interpretation made in the last 200, excuse me, in the last two and a half centuries. Joseph Mead was a fellow of Christ College in Cambridge, and he lived in the first half of the 17th century the century immediately succeeding that of the Protestant Reformation. He was a man of great learning and diligence and deep insight into the divine word and made prophecy his special study. 
Dr. Tweese, who was the prolocutor, prolocutor in the Westminster Assembly of Divines, wrote a preface to Mean's work on the apocalypse in which he says that, quote, as it is written of the virtuous woman in the Proverbs of Solomon, quote, many daughters have done virtuously, but thou surmountest them all, unquote. So it may be said of means of Mead's exposition of Revelation. Many interpreters have done excellently, but he surmounteth them all, unquote. Mead's key to the Apocalypse, written in Latin, was translated into English by Richard Moore, one of the Burgesses of the English Parliament. And the House of Commons published that translation in 1641, the year of the great massacre of Protestants in Ireland. Here is a copy of that work published by the House of Commons. The Puritan Parliament set its seal thus upon the historical anti-papal interpretation of prophecy and upon this valuable work by Joseph Mead. Mead did what no interpreter had previously done. He laid down the important principle that for the correct understanding of the apocalypse, it is necessary in the first place to fix the order of its principal visions apart altogether from the question of their interpretation. Accordingly, Mead sought to exhibit the synchronism and the succession of these visions, or the order of the prophecies contained in the Apocalypse. Setting aside and ignoring for the time all question of the meaning of these prophecies, he endeavored to demonstrate from the visions themselves the position they occupy with reference to one another. Their mutual relations once proved served as the most valuable clue to their significance. Mead prefaced his work with the prayer, quote, Thou who sittest upon the throne, and thou, O Lamb, root of David, who wast only worthy to take and open this book, open the eyes of thy servant, and direct his hand and mind that in these thy mysteries he may discern and produce something which may tend to the glory of thy name and profit of thy church, unquote. The first synchronism which Mead establishes is that of what he calls a noble quaternion of prophecies, remarkable by reason of the equality of their times. First, of the woman remaining in the wilderness for three and a half times, or as it is declared in the prophecy, 1260 days. Second, of the beast, whose deadly wound was healed, ruling 42 months. Third, of the outer court of the temple, trodden underfoot by the Gentiles for the same number of months. Fourth, of the witnesses prophesying in sackcloth 1,260 days. Mead points out that not only are these times equal, but they begin at the same period and end together and must therefore synchronize throughout their course. The events of the last 250 years have confirmed Mead's interpretation as to the general synchronism of these times. But they have also shown that these periods should be reckoned from an era rather than from a point in time, and that they terminate in a corresponding era. The three and a half times of prophecy date from the era of the rise of the papal and Mohammedan powers and extend to the era of the overthrow of these powers, in which era we are living at the present day. Let me refer you to a work on this subject, which I published a year ago, entitled Light for the Last Days, Tracing These Prophetic Times and the Eras of Their Commencement and Close. Need established several other synchronisms, as, for example, one between the revived Roman head of the Revelation 13 
and the two-horned lamb-like beast, which John calls elsewhere the false prophet, which acts for the revived head. He shows that the two are inseparable companions, that they are together alike in their rising and in their ruin, that the one exercises the power of the other, and thus, whatever be their meaning, that they are necessarily synchronous. He then traces the position of the remaining visions of the apocalypse as they stand related to these, showing which precede these central visions, which synchronize with them and which succeed them, thus making out the esta- and establishing the connection and order of the entire series of visions. And this, as I've already stated, apart from all questions of interpretation, having gone through the book of Revelation thus, Need next proceeds to expound and demonstrate his, it, its fulfillment in the events of history. I have said that Mead's work on Revelation was approved and printed by the Puritan Parliament. Just as that time, the Westminster Assembly of Divines drew up its most valuable confession of faith, a confession subsequently accepted by the National Presbyterian Church of Scotland. Here is a copy containing a list of the hundred Puritan divines who met in the Westminster Assembly, headed by the name of William Tweese, the prolocutor who wrote the preface to Mead's work to which I have already referred. The Westminster Confession of Faith endorsed the historical interpretation of prophecy and declared the Roman pontiff to be the predicted man of sin. Weigh well the following words of the Westminster divines upon this subject, embodied in the 25th chapter of their solemn declaration of these things, they held and taught on the authority of Scripture. Quote, There is no other head of the church but the Lord Jesus Christ, nor can the Pope of Rome in any sense be head thereof, but is that Antichrist, that man of sin and son of perdition that exalteth himself in the church against Christ and all that is called God, unquote. One of the divines who put his hand to this statement was the famous Puritan writer, Dr. Thomas Goodwin of London, and he, was le- and he has left us an exposition of the book of Revelation of which this is a copy. It belongs, I need hardly say, to the historical school and describes the apocalypse as the story of Christ's kingdom. Sir Isaac Newton followed Mead and the Puritan writers and further advanced the comprehension of prophecy. He was a Christian as well as a philosopher and took delight in studying and comparing the works and the word of God. The vastness of his genius led him to the most extensive views of the things natural and divine. He studied nature as a whole, history as a whole, chronology as a whole, and in connection with these, prophecy as a whole. While Mead directed his attention essentially to the apocalypse, Newton investigated both it and the book of Daniel, tracing out their connections with the course of history and chronology, utilizing in the latter his unrivaled astronomical skill. Here is a copy of his observations on the prophecies of Daniel and the apocalypse of John printed in the year 1733, six years after his death. In the first chapter, Newton says, quote, Among the old prophets, Daniel is the most distinct in order of time and easiest to be understood, and therefore in those things which relate to the last times, he must be made the key to the rest, unquote. In the third chapter, he says, quote, The prophecies of Daniel are all of them related to one another as if they were but several parts of one general prophecy given at several times. 
The first is the easiest to be understood, and every following prophecy adds something new to the former, unquote. Quoting again, in the vision of the image composed of four metals, the foundation of all Daniel's prophecies is laid. It represents a body of four great nations which shall reign over the earth successively, viz., the people of Babylonia, the Persians, the Greeks, and Romans. And by a stone cut without hands, which fell upon the feet of the image and break all the four metals to pieces and became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. It further represents that a new kingdom should arise after the four and conquer all those nations and grow very great and last until the end of all ages, unquote. In chapter 4, he says, quote, In the next vision, which is of the four beasts, the prophecy of the four empires is repeated with several new additions, such as are the two wings of the lion, the three ribs in the mouth of the bear, the four wings and the four heads of the leopard, and even an eleven horns of the fourth beast, and the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven to the Ancient of Days sitting in judgment. In chapter 7, he expounds the little horn of the fourth beast with eyes as a seer and a mouth speaking great things and changing times and laws and showing it to represent a power both prophetic and kingly, and that such a seer, a prophet, and a king is the Roman papacy. He traces its rise and the contemporaneous rise of the ten horns at the fall of the Western Roman Empire. He traces also its dominion and anticipates its doom at the close of the foretold period. He interprets the days of prophecy as years, reckoning, to use his own words, a prophetic day for a solar year. He shows the futility in his time and the proximity of the worldwide overthrow of the papal power. He says that the time had not then come perfectly to understand these mysterious prophecies, quote, because the main revolution predicted in them had not yet come to pass. In the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God shall be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. And then the kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever, unquote. Till then, he says, quote, we must content ourselves with interpreting what hath been already fulfilled, unquote. He adds, quote, amongst the interpreters of the last age, there is scarce one of note who hath not made some discovery worth knowing. And thence I seem to gather that God is about opening these mysteries. We must start at the foot of the cross. For our souls in danger, we're at loss. And when we kneel in that awesome place, at that very moment, you'll feel God's grace. Friend, let me tell you, you need to know, there is heaven, also hell below. Christ died on that cross to set you free from your vile sins and hell's agony. God's enemy without the cross. Reject Christ and to God your dross. To the prison of hell he will send just Christ's work on the cross makes amends. God hates those who try to enter in the gates of heaven still full of sin. Only his son can take sin away go to the foot of the cross this day. God has provided only one way to enter heaven's wondrous array. Except what Jesus did for us all, he paid our debt so hell won't befall. 
go to the foot of the cross this day. His precious blood washes sin away. We each need to think more of his cross. Without our Savior, we're total lost.